Hi, I'm Reverend Craig and I welcome you to this video in the tutorial series Shaders for Hobby Programmers. In the last video we created a gradient map shader as an introduction to recoloring and this time we're going to create its big brother a lookup table or a lot shader. But as always a short disclaimer first. This tutorial series is mainly for hobby programmers who struggle with understanding shaders. I'm not a professional programmer and I'm not very good at maps. So if you see a mistake in my video or see a better way to solve a problem, please add a comment so everyone can learn from you. To show what a lot shader is, we first need to understand lookup tables in general. A lookup table is basically a way to remap information without calculating the remap algorithm in runtime. Everything is pre-calculated somehow. I'm going to start with a lookup table for greeting phrases and then do the same with callers. I apologize if the greeting phrases are not in perfect English and don't always make perfect sense though. All the explanations in this video are in an interactive tool on itch.io as well by the way. A link to that is in the description of this video. So this is a one-dimensional lookup table for possible greeting phrases. The input is a time information and the output is a phrase. If we tell the program to give us a greeting suitable in the morning, the table will return good morning. That sounds simple enough, but try to think of a possible phrase to rudely say goodbye in the evening and make sure it's specifically for the evening and not for any other time. Or try to think of a phrase to politely greet someone you're meeting and the phrase has to work at any time of the day. To me, that's something complicated already. It takes a while to process. If you're much smarter than me, you could create an AI able to build suitable phrases that work at any given time, in any tone, for meeting or leaving someone, but that would take quite some processing power as well. However, if we create a table up front with all the possible phrases and then look them up whenever we need one, that's going to be really fast. But let's just add another dimension to this one for now. For a two-dimensional lookup table, we need two inputs. In this example, those are daytime on the x-axis and tone on the y-axis. A possible phrase to rudely greet someone at any time would be, what are you doing here? Now we can add a third dimension, the point in the conversation, the greeting phrase for when we're meeting someone or leaving someone. I had some difficulties showing a 3D table with phrases, but the third dimension here is just two different layers of the same 2D table. And this layer is the same as the 2D table from before, all phrases should work when we meet someone. But there's a second layer in the third dimension, a table for possible phrases when we're leaving someone. And according to this table, a possible phrase to politely say goodbye to someone in the morning would be, goodbye, have a nice day. And these examples should help understanding what's coming next, a color lookup table. We're starting with a one-dimensional table again. So we're remapping one color channel only, the red channel. Let's say this is the input color's red channel, 0.5. Now we need to think of an imaginary table with, in this example, only five entries. Red 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 and 1. And the values are spread linearly across the x-axis of this imaginary table. In the lookup table shader, we'd sample the red value of the input or fragment caller and calculate where on that imaginary table the red value would be. In this example, the input's red value is 0 0.5 and thus its position should be at the center of the imaginary table. And then we also send the real lookup table as a texture into the shader. In this example, a texture with only five texels. The red values of those five texels are 0, 0 0.125, 0 0.25, 0 0.375 and 0 0.5. We already know that the input color's red channel on a linear table ranging from 0 to 1 would be at position 0 0.5. So now we need to pick a sample from the lookup table at that position and the red value there is 0 0.25. So if the input color's red channel is 0 0.5, then the output color's red channel is remapped to 0 0.25. Mind that this table here only has an answer for input red values 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 and 1. Nothing in between. So the table cannot remap a red value of 0 0.4. We'll have to fix that later, but it's an important concept to understand. The lookup table can only remap an input value that actually exists on the table. Now let's add another dimension, the green channel. Let's say this is the red and green channel of the input color. Red is 0.5 and green is 0.25. If we think of the imaginary table again, where the red is on the x-axis linearly ranging from 0 to 1 from left to right, and add the green to the y-axis going linearly from 0 to 1 from top to bottom, then this would be the position on the imaginary table where we'd find the input color. Now this is the lookup table texture sent to the shader. And if we look up the color at the same position, we'll get the output color red 0.25 and green 0.125. To remap a full RGB color, we'll need a third dimension though. So let's take that step. This is the input color. 
Now let's add a z-axis for the blue channel to get the three-dimensional color cube. Again, this new axis ranges from 0 to 1, where 0 is on the front side of the cube and 1 at the back of the cube. And with this third axis, every color in the RGB space is somewhere inside that cube. So the shader gets the fragment's color and calculates its position inside the imaginary lookup cube. The input color in our example would be inside the color cube about where the dashed circle is. And again, we're sending a lookup texture into the shader. How we're going to do that, we'll look at in a minute. For now, let's just pretend it's a three-dimensional texture. This lookup cube here has increased brightness and contrast, but decreased saturation. Since we already know the position of the fragment sample inside the imaginary color cube, we can now take a sample from that position inside the lookup cube. And that sample will be the output color of our large shader. Now it's easy to understand how to look up the red and green value at the X and Y coordinates of a lookup texture, but the blue value is on the Z axis and a texture usually doesn't have a Z axis. So let's have a look at how the blue channel is stored in the LUT texture. This is the second page in the explanation tool on HIO I mentioned earlier. Here we got our lookup cube again. To turn the cube into a 2D texture, we just need to slice it up like this. So the top left cell is the front of the cube and the bottom right cell is the back of the cube. If we only display the red channel, we can see each cell is exactly the same, a gradient from left to right. And the same goes for the green channel, except the gradient is going from top to bottom. The blue channel is different though. The blue value is always the same within a cell, but each cell has a different value. But there's a problem here. There's only 64 slices and thus only 64 values of blue in this LUT texture. So you might wonder if there shouldn't be 256 slices. And the answer is yes and no. Yes, to be perfectly accurate, we'd need 256 slices and each cell would need to be 256 by 256 pixels large. But that would be a huge texture. It would need to be 16 cells wide and high times 256 pixels, so the texture would need to be 4096 pixels wide and high. And no, we won't really need that many slices. Interpolating colors will return a good enough result. In this example, we got 64 slices only, and there will be hardly any noticeable interpolation error. And by the way, it's not like we discriminate the blue color. In this example, each cell is 64 by 64 pixels small, and this means the red and green channel only have 64 values each as well. Now, since each cell is only 64 pixels small and we only need 8 cells per row and column to get 64 cells, this LUT texture is only 512 pixels large, much smaller than the other one. I also tried to go smaller, and the next smaller LUT would be 16 cells and each cell with only 16 values, so the whole LUT texture would only be 64 pixels small, and the result was quite good as well. In this video, I'm using a LUT texture with 64 values, but if you want to reduce texture size, you could try to go with 16 values and you'll probably won't be disappointed. So far, we've seen what a lookup table is in general and what a color lookup table looks like. Now let's have a closer look at how we're going to interpolate the RGB values. Here's our LUT texture again. First, we're going to take a sample of the base texture so we know what color we're remapping. Then we'll need to find the two cells on the LUT texture that are closest to the sample's blue value. Now we can calculate where within those cells the red and green of the base color would be, and we know that would be at the same position in both those cells because each cell's red and green channel are exactly the same. Once we got that position, we can take one sample from those two cells with the texture filter turned on. Like this, the red and green will automatically be interpolated already for free. To interpolate the blue value, we just mix the two samples. The closer the blue value is to the upper cell, the higher the mix amount needs to be. Like this, the output should be extremely close to the base color because this LUT texture has the original colors. But if we take another LUT texture, like in example this one, the output would be a remap version of the base color. Now let's do this step by step with the shader code. I didn't write this code by myself, by the way. What I'm showing here is nearly identical to what I found on Matt Delorier's GitHub space. A link there is in the description of this video if you want to read through it as well. We only need two varyings and two uniforms. VB text code are the UVs of the fragment on the base texture, not on the LUT texture. And I left VB color in there in case we want to tint the result or reduce its alpha using the vertex color. Float strength will be the effect strength, a value to mix the base color with the LUT color. And sampler 2D LUT text is of course the LUT texture. 
Now still in the header, we'll use macros to define the constants. Texture size in pixels is the width and height of the LUT texture, in this case 512 pixels. Cells per row is how many LUT cells per row there are, in this case 8 cells. Cell size is the width and height of the LUT cells in UVs, so it's 1 divided by cells per row or 1 divided by 8. Half texel size is the size of half a texel in UVs, so it's 0.5 divided by texture size in pixels. And finally, cell size fixed is cell size reduced by the size of one texel in UVs. Why we need this, I'll explain later. Inside the main function, we'll start by getting the base color. In our example, the base color of this fragment will be 180, 60, 144, or in a range from 0 to 1, that's about 0 0.706, 0 0.235, 0 0.565. Now we need to find the two cells with the blue values closest to the base colors blue. Here's the lot texture with only the blue channel showing. If we enumerate the cells starting at 0, these would be the cell numbers. With 64 cells starting at 0, the last cell will be number 63. With the next line of code, we'll remap the blue value from a range from 0 to 1 to a range 0 to 63. Blue 0.565 times 63 is 35.595. So we know the fragment's blue value is somewhere around here, a mix of the cells 35 and 36, a little bit more of cell 36. To interpolate the blue value, we'll need a sample from cell 35 and 36, so we need to get those sample coordinates next. First, we'll need to find the x and y position of the lower blue cell. We're not getting the UV coordinates yet, but the grid coordinate, starting at 0. Dividing the blue cell's remapped value by the number of cells per row and flooring the result says the lower cell is in row 4 on the cell grid. Flooring the blue cell's remapped value and subtracting the number of rows above it says the lower cell is in column 3 on the cell grid. Mind the original code had two floor functions like the part I commented out. I didn't notice a difference to just one flooring, but I'm not entirely sure if the shorter version is actually correct as well. Anyways, now the shader knows in what cell to take the first sample. Next we need to find out where exactly within that cell we can get the correct red and green values. This is a close-up of cell 35. With the next two lines, we're getting the UV coordinate for the first sample. We already got the cell's position within the grid. Now we can turn that into UV coordinates by multiplying the grid coordinates by the cell size in UVs. This will return the upper left corner of the cell on the LUT texture where the white crosshair is. I already mentioned to interpolate the red and green values, we're going to turn on the linear texture filter. But if we'd take a sample here at the crosshair, the filter would not just sample the blue color in the top left corner of our cell. The filter will also get some green from above, some magenta from left and yellow from above and left. To prevent that, we shift the coordinates by half a texel. The graphics here are a bit exaggerated of course, but half the texel is just too small to show clearly. Now that we know the top left corner of the range we can take a sample from, we need to add the base color's red value to the x coordinate and the base color's green value to the y coordinate. But those color values need to be remapped first. They're usually ranging from 0 to 1 and we need them to range from 0 to the fixed cell size, which is just cell size minus 1 texel size. Like this, the sample coordinate will now be somewhere inside the area marked by the four white crosshairs. Calculating those lines of code would tell us the sample's coordinate on the LUT texture is about 0.463 and 0.530, so a bit below and to the left of the LUT texture center. This sample coordinate will give us the red and green color and the blue of the lower cell. Now we'll need to get the coordinates of the upper cell. Again, we'll need to get the row and column of the upper cell first. The code is very similar to before, just this time we're ceiling instead of flooring. And thus the result for the upper cell is row 4 and column 4. And the calculation of the coordinates for the second sample are very similar as well of course. The result is at the same position within the second cell. So in this case, just one cell size to the right. And with that, we're finally ready to take the two samples and mix them. So we're taking an RGB sample from the lower sample coordinates and mix it with an RGB samples from the upper coordinates. The mix amount is simply the fractional part of the remapped blue value. The lower that fraction is, the more of the lower cell's blue would show, and the higher that fraction is, the more of the upper cell's blue would show. In our example, the fraction is 0.595, so the result will be about 40% of the lower and about 60% of the upper cell's blue. The next line is just an effect strength mixer. If strength is 0, only the base color shows, and if strength is 1, only the LUT color shows. 
With this uniform we can gradually tween from a base color to the remapped color. And finally, the last line, GL frag color, is the output color's RGB and the base color's alpha multiplied by the vertex color. So we can still use the vertex color to tint the result or change its alpha. The tool on itch.io also has a third page to play around with. It has different LUT maps and is helping to visualize how interpolation works. But now it's time to look at the project file. We won't need much for this demo really. First, there's a sprite with several LUT textures as subimages. The first subimage is just an unchanged LUT. The sprite is 512 pixels wide and high and it's on a separate texture page. In GMS1, that checkbox is called Used for 3D. Then there's another sprite with several subimages. Those are the demo sprites we're going to remap with the LUT shader. Here's the shader. The vertex shader is just a pass through shader. And the fragment shader is exactly what we looked at step by step a minute ago. In the demo room, we got the demo object on the main layer and some GUI elements on the GUI layers. A slider to change the effect strength, a toggle group to change the photo we're remapping, and a toggle group to change the LUT texture to remap with. And here's the demo object. In its create event, in the title region are just some descriptions and demo settings. And in the GUI region, I'm setting up the slider for the strength uniform and the toggle groups for the photos and LUT textures. The sprite and shader region is important and really simple. All we need is the sprite with the photos, the sprite with the LUT textures, the shader, a uniform handle for strength, and another uniform handle for the LUT texture. In draw event, I'm defining some local bars. Strength is just a slider value, so something from 0 to 1. LUT image is going to be the sub image of the LUT sprite, and to set that, I'm just checking which toggle button number in toggle group 1 is currently active. So if button 0 is active, the LUT image will be 0. LUT text is the texture of that subimage, and image is the subimage of the photo sprite. So if button 1 in toggle group 0 is active, image will be 1. And then I'm just drawing some 9 slice frames, unimportant for the effect, just part of the demo visuals. And after that, we need to turn on the GPU's linear texture interpolation filter for the LUT texture. If your game is interpolating anyways, you can of course skip that. Then we're setting the shader and passing the uniform strength and the LUT texture. And then we can just draw the photo sprite reset the shader, and you can reset the texture filter again in case you don't need it anymore. After that, I'm just drawing the LUT texture as well, so we can see the LUT and the result at the same time. And that's all really. So the GML side of this effect is extremely simple to implement. Now let's run this. With the toggles, we can set the LUT texture and the photo sprite. Not all photos look good with all lookup tables, so you'll always need to check if the effect looks cool anywhere you want to use it. And these are combinations I really like though. And with the slider we can set how much the base color is mixed with the LUT color. Now before finishing this video I'll quickly show how to create LUT textures. I'm using GIMP here and on the canvas is the original LUT texture and three reference images. Now you can just apply color effects to the whole image. In example, blend a solid color layer and merge it down like this. Or apply a U saturation effect. Or curves. Of course, you can't apply distortions or blurs and that kind of stuff. Only color adjustments won't change the structure of the LUT texture. When you're done, just crop the canvas to the LUT texture, or what I prefer is export it with the reference images and only crop it inside GMS. Like that, the exported image also always shows the reference. And that's it for this video. I'm not sure what's next, but I got some ideas, so stay tuned and until next time.